All right. It says that we're live on Facebook. So guys, I want to welcome you to another self-love conversation. My name is Gloria Ward, and here's what I want to tell you. It's Mental Health Awareness Month, ladies. And what that means is that all month long, which we do every day, is that we're going to work on our mind. We are going to talk to some amazing people like the one I'm about to interview, Miss Lauren Hsu, about mental health, the importance of mental health, and how we can actually end the stigma. Because one of the things that we recognize is that, you know, mental health became a buzzword, self-care became a buzzword, but we need to know exactly how much is needed and needs to be implemented in our lives. So we have our guest today, Miss Lauren, who is going to share her story with us of her journey in um, dealing with anxiety. So Lauren, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Uh, absolutely. So tell us your journey. Um, I, we read your blog and I loved it. I, and I can't wait to like get to the pieces, but I like how you started from the beginning. Can you tell us from the beginning some of the feelings you were feeling when you didn't know that you had anxiety? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, I've been experiencing anxiety symptoms probably since about like first grade or so. And I mean, at the time I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know anything was wrong. I thought, you know, it was just the way I was and everyone felt this way and that kind of thing. But um, like some of the different things that would happen, like a couple examples, um, just a lot of excessive worrying about things that maybe didn't really need to be worried about quite to the extent that I was worrying about them. Um, and when I was young, it kind of just got like, um, you know, I was kind of just called like, like a worry ward or that kind of thing. Like someone who just worried all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was excessive and you worried about the world or yeah. were you worried about toys. Like what are some of the things that you were worried about? Um, let me think. I think sometimes when it was things that were outside of my routine, I would get really worked up. So I remember when we would go on class, like field trips, the morning of the, the field trip, I couldn't eat breakfast and I would feel like I was going to throw up like every yeah. time. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like special events in school and stuff. So for example, we had like grandparents day where our grandparents were all going to come in and eat lunch with us and do some activities. And I got so nervous that I got like physically sick and had to go to the nurse's office for the whole day. And I thought I ruined grandparents day because I got sick and my grandparents came and it was just a lot of, uh, you know, <laughs> really stressful time for mm -hmm. like a first grader, but that's kind of when things started just a lot of excessive worries about things that were just kind of day-to-day -day life stuff. Um, and then it kind of started to get worse, I'd say like middle school time. Um, and that's when it started to manifest into social anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I attribute a lot of that to uh, bullying. So um, I experienced bullying when I was in sixth grade. Um, at the time, I didn't tell anyone about it. I don't even think, I didn't tell my parents I don't think I told anyone. I just kind of like internalized it and thought, okay, I can deal with this on my own. Um, and kind of just, uh, you know, it, it affected me. It affected me really in a big way, I think, in more than I realized. And I mean, at the time I was 11 years old, so I didn't realize, you know, that I should have been telling someone and getting help and that it really wasn't okay. I didn't know um, well, at the time. Well, at the time, you can think, you know, I'm probably a shy kid or, yeah. you know, uh, are you the only child? Uh, no, I'm actually the oldest of three. Oh, so, you know, I'm the oldest. I probably want to be by myself. There's so many things that you can tell yourself when this, this is happening, you know? Yeah. So it's very hard to actually pinpoint it at that time. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then um, kind of as I grew older, like high school, the social anxiety really started to get pretty severe. Um, and then into college as well, it continued. Um, so I started to, um, you know, in college, I discovered alcohol and drinking kind of became a big thing for me because then it just took away all of those social fears in particular and any worries that I had. So that was kind of a way that I dealt with it for a while. Um, but I think 
then I kind of was in my 20s and started working and that sort of thing. And it kind of came up every now and then. It wasn't, it was never so severe that it um, uh, impacted my life in such a way that I wasn't able to work or something like that. But um, it was definitely there. It was always present. So I started to see a therapist actually when I was in college for the first time. Um, and it did help a little bit, but I didn't really go for too long. Um, so it, it was kind of short lived. And then I decided to go back to a therapist again um, when I was 28. Mm -hmm. And that was like kind of like the, the catalyst or the starting point where everything started to get a lot better because I was able to work through a lot of really difficult things that I had never really faced before. I had never really like thought about or, um, you know, that I'd never worked through. So I was able to get a lot of help from a therapist um, from my therapist at the time and, and work through a lot of those issues. It was a couple years um, that I worked with her and just made so much progress and it helped me so much. And what was some of the things like when you said you were um, turned into alcohol, did that make you more outgoing? You know, you felt like, okay, this is my solution. Um, because I want people to know the, the, the traits of when you're not dealing with it. Some of the behaviors, excuse me, of when you're not dealing with your anxiety, you turn to other things. You feel like now this thing is making you, is like your superpower. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Um, in college, like, uh, for instance, it just became a lot easier to socialize, I, I always thought, okay, well, if I just have a few drinks first, then I can go to this party and I can feel comfortable talking to people right? Um, in situations like that. And also just, you know, I always just felt a little more comfortable if I had a few drinks and then it kind of just took the edge off of everything. At least it felt like it at the time. So I'd mm -hmm. say that's kind of where it started to, to come into my life. And it felt like a solution because it took away my inhibitions and all those fears and anxieties. But you know, at the same time, it took away my cognition and um, that kind of thing, which isn't good. <laughs> and so you you go to therapy, you finally discover what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And how were you feeling in that moment? Um, at first, it was really tough. Like, uh, like when I um, started going to therapy first, I, I was afraid to go to therapy. I remember I called the right. therapist for the first time. And I like left a voicemail and my voice like cracked on the phone. Cause I was like, I can't believe I'm <laughs> a therapist right now. Like what right. is going on? But then it just became so natural. And I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? Like, this is just so helpful. And I worked through some really hard things. And especially when you first start therapy, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's hard. You have to mm -hmm. go through a lot of stuff. That's really deep. That's really, um, hard for you. And you kind of work through a lot of that. And after you kind of bring it to the surface, that's when you can kind of clear it out and start working through it. Um, you know, becoming aware of it, of the things that are kind of deep seated in your right. subconscious and holding you back. And once right. you know what those things are and you can work through them, that's when you can really be free and let them go. And did the, and, and was it in therapy that you found out some of the things that uh, cause your anxiety. And, um, and when you did, you know, were you given the kind of um, tools to figure out how to work through that properly? Because one of the things that we don't want to face, Lauren, is that every, everything that happens to us comes from something, right? Mm -hmm. yep. If I have anxiety, usually it's because I'm afraid of something that now has came up from when I was younger, yeah. right? Yeah. Or I have this idea of who am I supposed to be mm -hmm. and what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I said to a friend the other day, you know, <clears throat> I'm used to getting good grades in school. I'm used to performing well. And uh, I would fail sometimes, but I knew in the end that I was going to come out on top. And when I would do things, uh, even like in my business or something like that, and I felt like I wasn't going to come out on top, I didn't know what the end was going to be. 
I would have so much anxiety because of me always being able to um, succeed. And so I was talking to another lady and it's so funny. <clears throat> she just asked a simple question. She said, well, where did that come from? And I thought about it and I said, you know, it comes from my grandmother always telling me to be the best. Yep. Just that simple. Yeah. Yeah. And because it was so ingrained in me to be the best. Yeah. When I felt I would get anxiety when I felt like I wasn't going to be. Yeah. Right. And, and it even got worse when, uh, the bigger the projects got and I didn't know or could not control what the outcome could be because that was another thing. She said, well, what is it that you're fearing that you feel like you can't control? And I said, everything, you know, <laughs> I'm saying everything, right? No. And the bottom line was, she said, you know, do you believe that that little girl has succeeded already and I said yeah absolutely so can you put her down yeah right but that's the stuff that we don't think about yeah definitely. right yeah those are the inside things and the deep things that you're talking about yeah that we don't think about that we have to work ourselves work within ourselves to figure out where these things are coming from yep. just as simple as being the best where my grandmother strongly believed she was encouraging me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. But the way my mind programmed that mm -hmm. was something different. Yep. So when you was working through your things, you know, what, what are some of the tools that was given to you? Yeah. Um, I think it's actually funny that you shared that example because I can really relate to that. Mm -hmm. and, and that was one of the big reasons <clears throat> why, um, at the time I pursued therapy because I was kind of getting caught up in the same exact mindset where um, I was so focused on achievement and being the best. And when something got in my way of that, I felt so terrible about myself. Mm -hmm. um, and through therapy, I really realized that that for me went back to um, the bullying. Yeah. And uh, that kind of went back to, um, you know, I was so hurt by that that by me being successful now as an adult was kind of like my way of being like, look, I am a success. Like, um, like, look at me now. I, That's like, right. I, That's I am right. good enough. Like, That's it was right. like my way of kind of proving it to the inner like bullies that were still kind of in the back of my mind. So mm -hmm. totally relate to that example um, of of having some sort of an inner like voice that's kind of programmed into you sometimes. Oh yeah, we know it's always <laughs> there. It's always there. I, yeah. I was um, I was saying that on our uh, inspiration in thirty that I do in the morning. I said that inner voice that talks to you, you know, that judge, that critic, that that comes to you every single day, and sits right next to you, and tells you little things like you know, you should be doing just a little bit more than what you're doing. You can go ahead and check that email. See, you're sitting on a couch and you're watching another YouTube video where you should be working, right? Yep. And you know that you got to write this paper, but you deciding to go out. Now, what's going to happen? And what I told the ladies was that judge is there to motivate you, right? But it, it does the exact opposite. It makes you a victim. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel depressed. It gives you anxiety. It's, it, it makes you feel hopeless. It yep. puts you in despair, right? Mm -hmm. So it actually works the opposite for you. Yep. And when you try to tell yourself, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get myself out of this thing, you need tools because what your mind is saying in your own voice or your mother's voice or the bully's voice or whoever. Yeah. And what you are experiencing is two totally different things. Yep. Definitely. Right? Yeah. And 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 it, and it's so crazy because now you're trying to figure out how do you navigate in this world? But what I like about your story, Lauren, is is that 
you was able to figure out what it was. A lot of us, especially women, is just walking around thinking because these are my own thoughts mm -hmm. and they're coming from me, it's okay. Yeah. And this is my life where oh. no, it's something more that's going on. Yep. Yep. And yeah. I need to get with someone to help me process these thoughts. Yeah. So as you went along, you, you, you did the therapy, mm -hmm. you worked through some tools. And then I know you said, uh, in the blog now you fell in love, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> and, yep. and tell us that story. Yeah. So, um, I met my husband, Jeff, when we were in college and, um, we got married, uh, when we were mid twenties. So almost seven years ago, this month actually will be okay. our seven year wedding anniversary. Um, Congrats. but, uh, I, um, so I met Jeff, fell in love with Jeff. Um, you know, he's my best friend, partner in life and in everything. And, um, we, you know, a couple years back went through a really hard time together in our marriage when I was pregnant uh, with our first baby. Um, and uh, I was probably about 20 weeks pregnant when everything kind of went down, as we would say. Um, mm -hmm. And um, basically my husband was acting very different. He was like withdrawn. It was really strange because he was never really withdrawn from me. Like we always had like a really close connection and communication and that sort of thing. So I knew something was wrong. Um, so I approached him about it. And uh, basically we both discovered because neither of us realized it at the time that he was um, depressed, really deeply depressed to the point that it was, it turned into a crisis. And he mm. He saw a therapist for the first time. He had to go to um, to a hospital and be hospitalized in the psychiatric unit, um, and that kind of kicked off his his uh, mental health journey. Um, which at that point, I had already been through therapy for probably. That's what I'm saying. What if years. he didn't have you? Yeah. So I you knew. Know, you know. Yeah. So you knew the signs and what to look for. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Definitely. Yeah. So I had some experience with the mental health area and, um, and then it kind of, you know, for about six months, he was having a really hard time. He was hospitalized a few more times. And um, that was almost, it was probably about two and a half years ago, almost three years ago now that all of that happened. And he's doing much better now. Um, he then last year was actually diagnosed, re-diagnosed with uh, bipolar depression. So um, bipolar type two um, and PTSD. Uh, so a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> wow. Well, my, my, my follow-up question to that is, and you have a baby mm -hmm. and you're working through your mental yeah. stuff. And now you're working with your husband, supporting him through his. Yeah. How in the world do you manage it all and a mom <laughs> have a business that is like, you know, like what, what, if, what is the secret? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, because you, I mean, that's, that's some heavy shit. You know what yeah. I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. How do you keep yourself if you have, you know, if you're trying to manage your anxiety Mm -hmm. How do you keep yourself in a position where you can support him? Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, it's a lot of things. So like, I always tell my husband, like, thank God I was already through uh, yeah. therapy for a few years and had kind of like my self-care toolkit put together so that I could help myself and then help him um, through his struggles too. But um, there's a lot of things that I do to, to really help myself and manage my anxiety. So the two biggest things is therapy and medication. Mm -hmm. Those two things are like the, the foundation, like the catalyst to making sure that I'm feeling good and I'm able to be there to support Jeff. Right. Um, the other really big thing for me is running. So I started running right before we got married. So almost seven years ago, and that really quickly became like a really big self-care thing for me. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so when I feel stressed, when I am not really having a great day and I just, I'm feeling anxious, I go out for a run, um, you know, a couple miles, like blast some music and that just completely turns around my mindset. So that helps me so much. That's been a really huge thing for me. Um, I would say in addition to that faith has been huge. Mm -hmm. Um, it's something that's pretty new to me too. Um, I really started to, um, started my faith walk as Jeff was going through the crisis. That's kind of what uh, brought me closer to, to God and spirituality in general. And that has been just totally so helpful for me and just critical um, to help me uh, be my best to support Jeff and myself and my family. Mm-hmm. So those are all really big things. I'd say like those are probably the biggest things that I really lean on um, that help me to be my best and um, support myself and my husband and also be able to advocate publicly for mental health, share my story and and just really have that passion. Right. And so when you are, when it's not a good day for you Mm -hmm. and it's not a good day for him, (laughs) you know, and hopefully you have more good days than bad days, but when they do come, how do you guys support each other? Mm -hmm. Because in those moments, that's when you guys are both tested. Yeah. And again, you have a little baby who doesn't know anything that's going on. It's just want love from mommy and daddy Yep. and is waiting for it. But mommy is trying to get herself together yep. so that she can. And daddy is trying to figure out these feelings so he can. Yeah. And, you know, when, when those kind of things come up, how do you guys support each other? Because I think that's important to say, because um, for those women who are out there who are in the same situations, most of us take on the burden. Like Mm I I hear you say, I turn to God, I do this, I do this to support this, and I do this and I do that. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you guys share that as a couple to really, you know, uh, uh, walk through this journey? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that, you know, each day, uh, you know, not every day is going to be great and cheerful. And, you know, we both have our own mental health struggles. And the thing that's really helped us, I think, to work through it together is just being really um, honest with each other about how Mm -hmm. we're feeling and what we need. So um, having a lot of, uh, just transparency to each other. Like today, I'm not feeling good. I'm kind of having a down day. I'm feeling a little anxious right now. Or him saying, you know, I'm kind of feeling down today. I'm feeling a little depressed. Um, Just having that transparency for us to be able to vocalize that to each other and then also tell each other what we need. So um, you don't say things like, is that because you don't want to change no diapers today? Like, is it because you don't want to get these bottles? Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes I want to. (laughs) Because because the mind does that. That is like real life, right? Yep. Oh, Lord, please don't let him feel down today because we got to put up this crit. You know? Yep. Yep. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) But continue. (laughs) But yeah, um, I would say like the transparency we're both also really like into mental health. Like we talk about yeah. mental health every day in our house. It's like, Good. we're always talking about it. Um, and we're also just like both in therapy. We're both talking about, you know, I'm working on this right now. Like maybe right. we can help each other with this or with that, or, you know what? I'm really not feeling too good right now. I really need to go for a run. Can you watch mm-hmm. the baby while I go out and run? Mm-hmm. Or like, I just need some time to myself. Like those would be some examples. And I'm also, um, I feel really fortunate because we live near my family. So they're also able to step in and support us if we ever need it. So um, we moved close to my family actually about two years ago and um, they've been super supportive. If if we ever need like someone to help babysit or anything like that, or just some support, sometimes they're always there to help us, which has been just crucial um, through this whole process. And, and I want people to also know that, you know, this is not 
everything that you do in your life. Like the stigma is, okay, once you're diagnosed, once you have this, okay, now you got, you know, two crazy people walking around and you're trying to figure out every day who is going to be less crazy. That's not what it is, right? You still go out, you still love each other, you mm -hmm. still have fun, you still around with friends, you still are able to engage, you have a business, which we're going to talk about in a second, and you're still able to live real life. Yeah. The only thing that you have done is that you understand that there is something else going on within you that you discovered and that now you can manage and talk about. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's okay because as much as people think that they are perfect, we are not. Yeah. And to be able to get over this stigma, we have to understand and not try to put people in a box to say, well, this is just their whole entire life. Right. Because that's, that's the thing that gets on my nerves when you tell somebody, well, you know, I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder or I have anxiety. Every little thing, if it seems like it's abnormal, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, she got anxiety. Oh, well, you know, you know, uh, she's bipolar, right? Yeah. I had a friend who, um, who came out and, and, and said that she uh, she was bipolar. So every time we would, you know, go do something or have fun or whatever, uh, it will be, you know, even around the family. Well, you know, she got that bipolar thing. So her mind ain't, you know, all together. And it's like, stop saying that, Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, stop using that as an excuse to not recognize that this person has really stepped up to say, you know, I know that there is something that is not right with me, but every day I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Yeah. So so there is date nights, right? And movies yeah. and sex <laughs> and love and all this stuff. It's not just, oh, we're going to sit and talk about our feelings all day. There's yep. a time and a place for that, right? right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, I like to think of it as, you know, it's no different than a physical illness or a physical right. like you you hurt your leg or something like that and you go to the doctor. It's it's no different from a mental illness where you aren't feeling that great mentally and you go see a therapist. Right. Me they're they're completely I would like them to be, you know, the same um, in society, but I think there's still a lot of, uh, you know, further for us to go. Um, mm -hmm. But I definitely think that that is, that is the case that it's just a, you know, it's a, a it's an illness, just as much as a physical illness is. Exactly. So a mom, mental health advocate, a running coach, <laughs> a business owner, <laughs> what other jobs you have? I actually do have <laughs> full-time job as a project manager. Full-time job as a yeah, project manager. Job. Yep. Right. And tell us about your running and your, in your business and how you integrate mental health in that, because I think that's amazing because I walk, I walk a lot mm -hmm. and I use walking as a way to de-stress. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, um, I realized that running was so helpful for me over the last couple years, especially I was doing a lot of races and everything before my son was born. And it helped me so much. Um, and there's been a lot of research that shows that, you know, there are endorphins that are released from exercise and that it really is good for your brain and good for your mood and it can help to relieve anxiety and depression symptoms. So I was like personally really, you know, experiencing that and benefiting from that. So I decided to um, become a running coach so that I could help others start to run and experience those same benefits. So I started to be really interested in, um, especially new runners, people who are newer to running yeah. or want to improve if they, um, you know, have a new goal or they want to start to kind of take the running to the next level. Um, I really wanted to be able to help those people so that they could do that in a healthy and sustainable way. Um, and so that they could improve their own mental health and well-being. So, Absolutely. Um, 
So and, that that, is and it's a form of meditation, you know, Definitely. when you're running, you're alone, it's you and your thoughts and your music, yep. and you are in tune with yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you're and you're in this whole zone and vibe and you do start to re release some stress. Mm -hmm. So if anyone who is listening, who's in a Pittsburgh area, how do we actually get in contact with you so we yeah. can go relieve some stress? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, actually, my coaching is completely virtual. So okay. most of my clients are not in Pittsburgh. They're all over the U.S. Um, so uh, it's completely virtual. Um, and, uh, and basically, I coach through, there's a, a platform that I use to share workouts, routines um, that people can incorporate into their schedule and, and really help them with kind of some of the basics of how to get started um, safely and with training plans and all of those things if they want to train for a race. So, um, you know, if anyone's interested, um, you can reach out to me. You could email me, uh, lauren at runningforwellness.com. You can also check out my website, which is runningforwellness.com, where I have a lot more information about my run coaching. But I also, um, on the blog, uh, blog a lot about mental health. So I share a lot on there about my story, about my husband's story, about our journey together. Um, in our family and talking about running and, and giving more information about running to help people that are interested in running to, um, to learn more and be able to improve. So that's really, um, you know, what my, uh, my blog is all about and what my, my goal is. The biggest thing is really about breaking the stigma about mental mm -hmm. illness. That's my passion. That's what drives me. That's kind of like the why behind everything. And then kind of the how is sharing my story and helping people to run so that they can also improve their mental health. Right. You know, and, and the reason is, you know, the stigma is out there, but I, I strongly believe people like you, people like me and others, the more we talk about it, the more people will be able to step up and know and, and feel confident that they can be able to come forward and say, hey, I know that there's something wrong right? Mm -hmm. I just don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And and I need to figure out what that is so that I can know what to do. Because right now, the only thing that I'm feeling is whatever it is that I'm feeling. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah. I think yeah. it's super relevant right now with COVID too. Um, so many people, even people that have, have reached out to me, like through my platform and just said, you know, thank you for sharing. I'm seeing a therapist for the first time. I think a lot of people are going through a lot of really hard things now and over the last year and a half. And that's why I feel like now is a critical time to kind of spread the word and put the awareness out there that it's okay if you're not feeling okay. It's okay that's not right. to be okay all the time. And that help is available. And, um, you know, there's no shame in getting help. There's right. no shame in um, admitting that you don't feel good, um, that right. things are going on. So that's really, I think, important, um, especially right. now. And you're everything. not crazy and yep. you're not, you're, you're not this person who is unhealthy. Yeah. You're, you're not all of these things that, uh, society says you are, you don't know what you're feeling until you're able to talk with someone. Yeah. Right. Definitely. So you, you, you don't put labels on yourself. Totally. You don't even know what the hell is going on. Yep. Find out, discuss it with someone you trust. Yep. And then from there, go ahead and get the help you need. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Lauren, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Gloria. Thank you for telling your story and, and bringing your wisdom and, and giving us, you know, some some tools and thank you. I, 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 you are in my prayers, you and your husband. I, I strongly believe that, you know, everything happens in divine order. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that he has you because, you know, when you said what you said, I said to myself, I said, okay, she went from being a bully to a mental health advocate to now putting putting all of her work not only into what she do but her family so you're actually helping someone change their life mm -hmm. you get it 
Yeah, yeah. It just so happens to be the person that you love, which yeah. makes it even more exciting and, and, and making you more committed to making it work, even though you know that it's, it's, it's challenging sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. But it's also helping you understand more of who you are, because mm -hmm. at the same time, you have this little person watching both of you. Yeah. trying to figure out what is this thing that they're doing they're smiling yeah. they're not smiling they're excited they're not <laughs> excited right <laughs> yeah but it works out so yeah. many blessings to you and your family and thank you for coming on okay thanks gloria i really appreciate it oh absolutely see you soon thanks bye bye